Very exciting day for us because we've been doing this faculty speaker series now for eight years, starting this semester. I think that's pretty good, right? So, uh, Steve Davis and I back there in the back of the room, he's chawing down on some pizza. We've been doing this for uh, quite a while and we've really enjoyed it. And we've had all sorts of good talks um, in this series and it's very much a pleasure today to have Dr. Joan Samuelson give a talk on Virginia Woolf's birthday. This is her actual birthday, January the 25th, 1941. And uh, because Joan was one of the very first people or professors that took part in this uh, series, I think her first talk was on the hero in literature. But she's given other talks as well, and I know she'll do more in the future. So um, when I approached Joan about doing this talk on, on Virginia Woolf's birthday, she left at it. So by way of introduction about Virginia Woolf, um, she is a very interesting character, and if you don't know much about her, I'm very pleased to know that you're going to be here today and learn more. Uh, this summer, in England, my wife and I uh, visited Virginia Woolf's home outside of London. It's called Monk's House. It's not a very big house. Uh, but when we were there, uh, there were people from all over the world that day at her house. People that had been touched by Virginia Woolf's uh, writing, her fiction, or her nonfiction, her essays. Um, my favorite, personally, is her essay, her anti-war piece called Three Guineas. And she writes in there about people who want her to donate money uh, for uh, war preparations against Germany in the 1930s and she essentially writes you know I've been donating to men all my life she said in fact women have been donating to Arthur's education fund since the day they were born and what she meant by that was of course that women had not had the same opportunities as men and that they had been giving and giving and giving for thousands of years to things uh, so that men would have opportunities. Uh, and so she was skeptical about contributing uh, to war uh, as an opportunity uh, for uh, uh, improvement in society. I don't want to say too much, simply to say, if you haven't read Virginia Woolf, you need to, I want you to, and hopefully, and I think she will, uh, Dr. Samuel, Samuelson will convince you to today. So let's give her a round of applause. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you so much on this Wednesday afternoon and welcome to Virginia Woolf's 175th anniversary of her birth today. And it was deliberately set for today, yes, for that reason. And those are her dates. Why are we talking about Virginia Woolf and why is she um, important still today? She was in her own time. And then, like so many women writers of her time, she was lost. And I'll talk about how that happened and who lost these women. And then when she was refound in the third wave of, can you hear me okay? In the third wave of uh, the women's movement. We are now in the fourth wave of the women's movement, okay? And I will talk about that as well. It did not begin in the 70s, however. It began much earlier. And to really talk about Virginia Woolf, I want to set her in a timeline with you. Okay, and it'll be both women writers, modern women writers, and the women's movement. And yes, I'm going to take it and I'm going to bring it all the way through last Saturday and the worldwide women's march. Okay, so we're going to start here. And for heaven's sake, I've got this up here. And did you ever wonder why the play by Albee and the movie was called Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And that's why the flyer looks the way it does. Well, when I was young, this, uh, the play was published in 62. The film came out in 66, and, and not, we were all very young, and none of us knew who Virginia Woolf was. None of us knew who she was or why anybody was afraid of her. Okay? It won the Tony. Big deal, right, in drama. Elizabeth Taylor won the Academy Award for her performance. Burton was nominated. And Sandy Dennis, who was very, uh, not well known at all at that time, won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. It is a rollicking, knockdown, drag out battle 
okay, between two people who love one another but fight constantly. And some people felt that it mirrored the actual Burton Taylor marriage. And Taylor's character is constantly on the edge of madness, okay. That still doesn't help us much. What do we mean when we say who's afraid of Virginia Woolf and why did I say, insist, that we should not be afraid of Virginia Woolf? Virginia Woolf battled depression all her life and I'm going to talk to you about why she did. Some people will tell you that she was mad or she was in and out of madness. I think most of us today would probably identify it as untreated, severe, clinical depression. Okay, that she moved in and out of her entire life, all the way to her untimely death. And we'll come back to that later in the talk. But the other reason why Albee named it Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was a play on the nursery rhyme, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? And we didn't know that then. We had to read about it later. Okay, and what he meant was there is a disconnect often between reality and fantasy, sometimes in all of our lives, sometimes in film and TV programs, and sometimes when we're just walking across campus, there can be that kind of disconnect. And it can border in the mind of someone like Virginia Woolf on the edge of what some people would call madness. So there's going to be a madness theme in this talk. There's also going to be a death theme in this talk. And then there's going to be my third belief about that title. I don't think it's so much about who's afraid of the big bad wolf or who's afraid of, of sanity. I prefer, as someone who loves Virginia Woolf, to think that it is a, an invitation. Don't be afraid of her. She's complicated. She's challenging. Some people might consider her difficult because she is a stream of conscious writer. And I'll talk more about that when I get into her actual literature. But those of you who love Reservoir Dogs and those kinds of films that can start at the end and move to the front and then swirl around that core, right? Those are stream of conscious narratives as well. And the second point is there will be multiple narratives in a stream of conscious, okay? Once you understand that, then you can follow the narrative, and I will come back to that again. But that's why the movie was called Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? None of us knew who Virginia Woolf was, though. In fact, we had never heard of any of these people because they were lost. So I'm going to take you back in time, and then I'm going to come back forward, and Virginia's going to find her place in this timeline. Okay, and then I'm going to bring you and Virginia all the way to Saturday. Okay, and I'm going to connect 200 years of a women's movement through Virginia Woolf and the women writers that she inspired. Mary Wollstonecraft. I'd never heard of her and I was an English major because she had not been rediscovered yet. Today, she is regarded as the mother of the women's movement. And this is the founding manifesto that I'll be talking about in just a second. But I also wanted you to know that this important woman, who died at only age 38, of puerperal fever, also called childbed fever, gave birth to Mary Shelley. I'll say something about that in a moment. Until the discovery of penicillin and the discovery of antibiotics, too many people did not understand that in fact when the doctor took care of a patient over here, did not wash his hands, went over here and gave birth to, uh, helped Mar uh, her give birth to Mary Shelley, that he was carrying bacteria. That's childbed fever. It was a death sentence. Mary Shelley's mother died 11 days after her birth and she never knew her mother. Point I want you to keep in mind. Mary Shelley was a motherless daughter because there's going to be someone else, okay? A lot of you may not know, my students do, and maybe some of you do, that the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, Mary Shelley, was the author of Frankenstein. A woman, this is all about women writers, a woman wrote Frankenstein, not a man. This woman was barely a woman. She was 19 years old. She's the age of a lot of our students, a kid, but a genius and the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, also a genius writer, okay?
It is absolutely stunning. I'll, have, I'll come back to the 19th century writers in a moment and talk about what happened to them and their audiences. By the way, you probably do know, I hope, that Frankenstein is not a horror novel. It is not a horror story, is it? It is a psychological tragedy. Okay, and we are inundated by the 1931 Boris Karloff movie interpretation, which has nothing to do with what Mary Shelley actually wrote. The daughter of the founder of the women's movement wrote Frankenstein. Let that sink in. This is the manifesto of the women's movement, over 200 years old, 1792. A couple of other people I'm going to talk about introduce you to before we get to Virginia because these are lost women writers and we want to bring them back, okay? A vindication of the rights of woman and she spelled it woman as in the woman, the soul of woman. Before I go into her specific points, I wanted to mention John Stuart Mill. So let's, let's acknowledge our brothers. Some of the most powerful feminists in women's studies and women's history are men, the men who love us. They are often the strongest and the best and the hardest working for women, and they're wonderful supporters of women. John Stuart Mill married a woman named Harriet that he was in love with the whole time she was married. They stayed away from each other. They, were, they, they respected the relationship until Harriet's husband finally died. Once he died, Mary, uh, he, uh, John Stuart Mill, sorry, was able to marry the woman of his life. Some people believe that Harriet actually wrote on the subjection of women, okay? The style is John Stuart Mill's. Why am I going on about this Victorian writer? John Stuart Mill was one of the most famous writers, one of the best philosophers, one of the resident geniuses. It was estimated his IQ was around 200. Okay, a phenomenal man, and a man who believed in the equality of women. He believed that that was a civil right, that women should be able to vote, that women should be able to write, that women should be able to be equal in all matters throughout their society. And he is the one who wrote on the subjection of women. Sounds very similar, doesn't it, to on the vindication of women. He argued that women were treated as servants in their own time and that they deserved to be released from that. So remember John Stuart Mill, Mary Wollstonecraft all argue that women should be equal, but Mary's going to go a little bit farther. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, French philosopher, believed in the equality of men, of all men, all classes, okay? but he didn't include women. Mary Wollstonecraft disagreed. He, didn't, he thought women were weak. He thought that women um, didn't deserve the vote, didn't deserve to be considered equal, and Mary Wollstonecraft put herself out there and disagreed with one of the most famous philosophers of his day. And she argued that women needed to be regarded as equal, they needed to be educated, which Rousseau disagreed with. And the most important point, and to you, it's going to sound, well, yeah, right? She believed that the people who are giving birth to both men and women and raising men and women, okay, ought to be educated if they're going to be raising the next generation. Makes perfect sense, okay? But it was ignored at the time. This was her argument, and she was the one who almost came up with this idea of the flower pot, women as pots in the window, okay, or in the corner. And she insisted that A, women should be equal, they should not be discarded to the corners somewhere like a, a potted plant, they should be educated. And by the way, ladies, she also believed in physical education, PE. She felt that, I work out, and I hope you do too, she felt that we needed to be strong physically as well as intellectually if we were going to carry the next generation forward. Of course, she was absolutely right. And then she argued that all women, if they were strong and if they were educated and if they were treated equally, could contribute equally to a society. And then what happens? If everybody is educated and everybody is contributing equally to the society, then that raises everybody. Correct? 
floats all the boats, right? They were right, of course. They were pretty much ignored and criticized for those opinions. Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp, most people know that, of course, she was a nurse. I'm not about to stand here and tell you that she was a feminist because she was very hard on her nurses. She often smacked them around. We've got to tell the truth. It's very tempting. In fact, I'm going to go for it. We can't have alternate facts, all right? And I am going to go there. And, <laughs> and, and it's thank you. And it is well deserved because I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. I would not call her a feminist. Um, and she was hard on some of the nurses. And she did sometimes smack them around, okay? And a lot of people were surprised to find out that, in fact, she was a very fine writer. I didn't know this. Everybody I'm telling you about, I did not know about until the 70s, okay? Florence Nightingale was a really good writer. And she wrote this piece, Cassandra, and you can Google Cassandra later on and figure out, find out why it was such an important title. And listen to this. There are going to be times when I'm going to be giving you Virginia's wolf. Virginia Woolf's voice, and then I'm going to close with her voice at the end of her famous essay. But I want you to start picking up on some of the, the um, memes here, what we would say call memes today, and some of the themes because they're all starting to gather and move toward her most famous essay. And Florence Nightingale, the woman that most of us did not know was a believer in the rights of women, but not, we would say, feminist, women never have a half hour in all their lives that they can call their own without fear of offending or hurting someone. In other words, from morning to night, they were working in the homes, raising kids, cooking the meals, etc. How the heck are you supposed to create anything if your hand, as she said, in one hand is a spoon and in the other hand is a diaper where are you supposed to put the paintbrush? Where are you supposed to put the pen that enables you to create? She said this because doubtful men, and there were men who were very supportive, but men who were not supportive of women's rights would say, where's your Leonardo da Vinci? Where's your great symphony? Where's your great painting? You've never done anything great. Okay, you're not artists, you're not real. And she made this point, and I want you to keep that in mind as well, because this argument will come through as well. That's the background, the, what we call sometimes today the backstory. Now I'm turning to Virginia, because you may be wondering, you know, when's she going to get to Virginia? This is Virginia's time now. Virginia Woolf was upper middle class. She was absolutely lovely. She and her sister, I'll show you in a moment, looked just like their mother. And it was a loving family with an incredibly dark side. And as I tell my Holocaust literature classes, you know, nothing human is alien to us, and there is a dark side. She was the daughter of Sir Leslie Stephen, as I, I put right there, as an author and historian, I didn't spell everything out for you, but the librarians know that the Dictionary of National Biography is in our library. Well, Sir Stephen was the first editor of the DNB. It is a major research series in all collegiate and major city libraries. In other words, it's a big deal, okay? He was very well known, very erudite. He married Julia Duckworth, and I'm giving you this backstory for a reason, okay? Julia's on her second marriage, so she marries, Virginia's not born yet, she, he marries Virginia. Julia brings three kids, and listen to this part of it closely, into this marriage with Leslie, okay? He br she brings a daughter and two brothers, Gerald and George. She and Leslie go on to have four kids. Virginia, our subject, Vanessa, her sister, they're very, very close, and two sons. One is Adrian, not, doesn't figure into the story, and Toby, who does. Sounds cool, huh? Julia found a new husband, everything was great. The kids got a new dad. We've got seven kids in this family. Gerald and George, sexually assaulted Virginia and Vanessa all their lives until they finally got out of that house. Let that settle in as well. It's shocking, isn't it? 
It's shocking. And then Julia died when Virginia was only 13 years old. The sexual assault intensified and Virginia and Vanessa were helpless. In those days, today we say believe women, don't we? We say believe women. When we tell you this has happened, believe us. We shouldn't have to prove that to you, okay? Believe us. In the Victorian age, and so there's been some carryover from that, nobody would believe, okay? Virginia was the major victim of the attacks. Julia dies, Virginia has a collapse. And then the assaults continue because Julia's gone and the attacks intensify again. So our writer has lost her mother, nobody is protecting her, and she is the victim of both half-brothers from early life. I know this is rough, but it is my feeling that that was probably the trigger for the bouts of depression she suffered from all her life. Virginia was saved in a lot of ways, though, because she and Vanessa, and you see how beautiful they are and how much they look so much alike. I didn't put a picture of Julia up here. There are a lot online that you can find, but I had to keep my slides down. But they look exactly, to me anyway, like their mother, the mother that they lost. Vanessa was a great comfort to Virginia, and they took care of each other. Here comes the third tragedy, though. Virginia's brother, Toby, was, in a sense, the love of her life. She adored her little brother. He was precious to her, and in, uh, in, in many, many ways, a kind of salvation for her, uh, something good happening in her life. Toby caught typhoid and died when he was 26 years old. All of these deaths and all of these attacks are followed by Virginia Woolf's collapses. If you read biographies of her, they'll tell you, well, she was mad, she was crazy, crazy woman, couldn't, couldn't stand on her own two feet, what a weakling. I'm thinking that this is, of course those are cruel, and I'm thinking that these, these are classic signs of clinic depression, and I'm not calling it manic depression. I think that she was a victim. Now, there is a bright side as well. Virginia Woolf was bisexual, okay? And Vita Sackville West was one of her best friends and also her lover. This a, a relationship was mutual. They loved one another. Um, and Vita Sackville West, they were both married, and Vita Sackville West was in an open marriage and had lots of affairs, but she is famous for the affair with Virginia Woolf. Okay, they loved each other very much, but Virginia met Leonard, and that's where the Woolf name comes from. Leonard was a writer also. Leonard won her over, and they married in 1912, and I don't know if any of the relationship with Vita Sackville West continued. I, I don't even really care. I know that they, they loved each other, but she also loved Leonard, and they were very, very close. And together they did amazing things, which I'll come to in just a moment. That's them when they married in 1912. However, tragedy number four. Remember all those bouts with depression that some people call madness? Okay not having a whole lot of people to help take care of her. Virginia Woolf was institutionalized several times for the depression. Other times it wasn't as severe, but Vanessa and Leonard kept Virginia at home and took care of her. They took care of her themselves. They loved her. And they knew the genius that they had, that I haven't even gotten to yet. They knew the genius that they had in this woman. And they loved her and they protected her through this. It was too much. In 1941, when she was 59 years old, she could feel it coming again. She could feel, and we'll talk about the voices in a moment too, she could feel the voices starting again. This was not madness, this was something else, at least I don't think it was, that I'll talk about. She could feel the depression rising again. She knew that Virginia, Vanessa, and Leonard would have to take care of her again. 
Also, it's 1941, right? What are the Germans doing? They're bombing England, right? They had moved out of London to escape, but she could still hear the bombs falling and she could see the planes. So this is a woman who can feel the mental illness. I don't really consider it that, the, but that's what some people do. The depression rising again. She knows that it's gonna be weeks, months in an institution or institutionalized at home that nobody's going to be there except Leonard and Vanessa and they have a right to leave their lives. She wouldn't do it. So while they were away from the house, their house in the country, she was wearing a house coat with pockets. She went to the River Ouse, spelled O-U-S-E, that runs 200 miles down the length of England and she picked up rocks and she filled the pockets with the rocks and she walked to the river and she walked into the river and she kept walking and she kept walking until she finally went under and she drowned herself. This is the letter that she wrote Leonard that you've just read while I talked that she could not bear to put them, especially him, through it again. And she also couldn't bear to go through the depression, mental illness, madness, various people call it various things. But I love the ending. She loved her man. If anyone could have saved me, it would have been you. Everything has gone from me except the certainty of your goodness. That was just Leonard, and she was focused on Leonard. I can't go on spoiling your life any longer I don't think two people could have been happier than we have been. And she left him that to hold on to. Beautiful. But we're not going to leave it there. Had to tell you the story. Want you to fall in love with her. Want you to understand her and, and why she was Virginia Woolf and who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. Because triumph is now what we're going to talk about. This woman rocks. She was brilliant. She was a genius. Fact. Together, she and Leonard formed the Bloomsbury Group. You probably can't read all those names. Doesn't matter, I'll just tell you. They were the leading philosophers, painters, economists, and writers of the day. And they lived happily in London. I've been to London. I've walked to that spot where they met Bloomsbury. It's amazing. Those people wrote together, lived together, slept together, yes they did, and they partied. And there are pictures of them at the beach and there are pictures of them working together. They were a commune, basically, an intellectualized, uh, weaponized in some ways, commune that rocked and they were extremely popular. And she gave back. I'm going to talk about another writer in just a few minutes. I'm watching our time, um, who also gave back. And it might surprise you that they're all in the same timeline. She and Leonard came up with the Hogarth Press. And their house was Hogarth. This was in London. This, somebody has a private house now, but this is the, the Greater London Council historical marker there. What was the Hogarth Press? They published themselves. They published the Bloomsbury Group. They published Dostoevsky. They published French, Roman, uh, sorry, Russian writers, etc. And they also published, at that time, an unknown poet was just coming over from America and kind of hanging out in England for a while, had left his doctoral program at Harvard. He was upset with America for lots of reasons, also didn't want to fight in World War I, so he comes straggling over T.S. Eliot, and they published The Wasteland, okay? <laughs> Virginia Woolf was a writer who gave back to other writers, okay, and helped other writers um, write and get published and become famous. Now, I told you I was going to go back to the 19th century women writers and, and while you just kind of go through there. And you can read through there while I talk. Virginia studied all of them. She read all of them. She read everything. And she loved them. She knew those Bronte sisters. I don't know if all of you knew that there was a third Bronte sister, Anne. She wrote The Wild, uh, Tenant of Wildfell Hall, okay? I don't know if you knew, however, you probably did, that the Bronte sisters had to publish under a male pseudonym because they couldn't get published because they were women. 
So they were Acton Currer and Ellis Bell, the initials of their first names, okay? After Arthur Bell, a friend of theirs. In other words, they had to have a man's arm, so to speak, to get published, right? Look at poor George Eliot. I never refer to her to George Eliot except that time. Her name is Mary Ann Evans but it was the only way she could get published. Jane Austen managed, but she had an inside track because her father was a very well-known uh, pastor, okay, and they were sort of middle class to upper middle class, and she knew people. So it worked a little bit better for her. Okay, but most of these women could not function without the help of a man, even getting published, okay? And I told you earlier, even Frankenstein, although she was finally able to get it published through her husband, Percy Shelley, the romantic poet, when they found out that a woman had written it, then there was a lot of criticism. How could she write that scary story? Okay. Wolf argued that these women, women, of course, were brilliant. They were wonderful. But they could have been even better had they had their own space, which I'm coming to in just a moment, and their own financial independence, that they too often were writing uh, in a masculine way. There's a big debate about whether or not there's such a thing as masculine and feminine writing, and that's a whole other talk, okay? But she believed that they could have written even more, and even androgynously, both male and female. She doesn't mean that in a sexual sense at all, but in consciousness. There's one area where I disagree with her a little bit. I think Jane Austen did it. And um, Jane Eyre is a brilliant novel, and so is Villette. If you don't know Villette, some people feel that Villette is even better than, uh, than Jane Eyre. But Jane Eyre is actually regarded today, Virginia, as the first feminist novel. Okay, the, Jane is an actual scrappy little kid from day one who stands up to everybody throughout the novel, escapes uh, a situation that's bad for her, because I don't want to give too, mi too much away, R attains her independence, and I don't want to give that too much away either, and actually rescues the hero, the alleged hero, Rochester. She saves him, okay, and that's not giving anything away because she's been saving him from the beginning. So Jane Austen did nail it, definitely, in Jane Eyre. Now I'm turning to Virginia's work. We're not going to leave her in the river ooze. She wrote 10 novels. While, the, while she was fine, when she was out of the depression and people were helping her and keeping her on her feet, she wrote like a bandit. 10 novels. I have taught Dalloway and Lighthouse. And what I do, I tell the students, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? I tell the students she's tough. She will challenge you. She's a stream of conscious writer. What you gotta understand is that there are gonna be multiple narrators in this and it's gonna spiral, okay? And you need to understand that. It will spiral out, but she's always gonna bring you back. Stay with her. Follow that cab ride all the way through that opening scene in Mrs. Dalloway. And that, sh that boat that goes to the lighthouse, stay on that boat and pay attention to who all the narrators are. She will reward you. Virginia regarded life as sitting inside, this is a quote from her, sitting inside a transparent envelope, being bombarded by atoms of experience. It's messy, isn't it? The, the old joke is, just try, go ahead and try to plan out your life. God's got a great sense of humor, right? And every time you try to plot it out, there's, only, there's no such thing as plot except in a novel, right? And it's an arbitrary, contrived way of telling a story. Okay? Well, Virginia said, actually, the way it happens, this life business is, it comes like this, atoms of experience. So what the author does is catch those atoms, okay, and corral them and organize them into this plot and into these narrators. She felt that the only way to tell the truth, real facts, was multiple narrators. Not just one, but you had to tell the whole story from everybody's perspective. Right. To the Lighthouse and Mrs. Dalloway are the most famous of her novels, all the way to Orlando. They're all well worth your reading. The one that John told you about, Guineas, is important. But also, look at this. These are the works of Virginia Woolf. Despite the fact that she had known terrible tragedies in her life and was definitely affected by the sexual attacks on her, as a, as a child until she finally got out of that house. Look at those. Literary critic, she wrote 
two major volumes, one called The Common Reader, the other called The Second Common Reader. Remember those 19th century writers? She wrote about all of them in The Common Reader. But this is the one. I was an English major and I didn't know about this until it was rediscovered by the feminist press in the 70s. After Virginia's death, and World War II took everybody's minds, and then the Holocaust, of course, and people are overwhelmed by the tragedy of World War II and the Holocaust. She slips into oblivion. Nobody's reading her, nobody's remembering her anymore. But we're gonna have a victory about that in a moment. In 1929, she was quite popular and she was invited to lots of groups to speak. She published A Room of One's Own in 1929. She has four Marys in this. It's a, it is an, called an extended essay. There are four Mary figures. The major one is Mary Seton. And she, so she's got four narrators. And of course, she's going in and out of these narrators all the time. Okay. Major themes, education, sound familiar? Wollstonecraft, John Stuart Mill, major. She absolutely believed that women had the right to get an education <laughs> and go to college. The colleges had been open since 1930s, okay, but not all of them, sorry, 1830s, but not all of them had been admitting women just yet, and some were locking them out. This quote is from that essay. She talks about a made-up college, Oxbridge, which of course is Oxford and Cambridge, okay? And she's talking about Oxford specifically. And she says she goes into the library and she wants to study. And one of the Oxford dons comes after her. And the Oxford dons wear the hat. They wear what you wear at graduation. At this time, they're wearing it all the time. So they've got these gowns, voluminous sleeves and the gowns and everything. She says this guy comes, he looked like a big bird. He looked like a big black bird chasing her down. And he chased her out of the library. Why? Because she was a woman. She had no business on Oxford campus or in the library. So she went down to the river and she sat down and she thought about it. And then she said, go ahead, lock up your libraries. There's no gate, no lock, no bolt that you can set upon the freedom of my mind. And that clarion call was shared with other women of the time. She argues that throughout history, women have not been able to write or do other artistic endeavors or run a shop or be independent at all be, and live their own lives because, and this is the root of a room of one's own, they have no privacy. There's no place that's quiet. Remember what Nightingale said, morning, noon, and night. Well, we have a spoon and diaper, okay? There's no time. How are you supposed to create? So she argues, women need a room. They need a space that's theirs, that they can lock. Nobody can come in there. They also need 500 pounds. That doesn't sound like much. And in fact, I looked it up. Isn't the internet great? So I found a calculator and I looked it up. 500 pounds in 1920 was $7,200. And I thought, geez, you can't live on seven. Wait a minute. Wait, a minute. that doesn't sound right either. So put in 7,002, right? $90,000? That's the buying power of 7200 She was saying, I, she didn't just say, I, I want enough money so I can buy you know, a little bit of food. She was saying she wanted to be financially independent. The women should be financially independent and they needed space. And let me pause for a moment. Doris Lessing is a major woman writer of the 70s. She's on a list I'll show you in just a second. She wrote a story that I used to teach a lot at Ohio State <coughs> and I've taught it here as well, called Two Room 19. Some of you may know this. And it's a short story about a woman who's married and has kids, and she's upper middle class, and she's quite comfortable, but she wants some privacy. It's all day long pulling at her, and she wants some privacy. And I want you to remember this also, Virginia worried all the time about women who didn't have any privacy and who didn't have any space of their own and couldn't create. She worried about them going mad because of course she was dealing with mental illness. She worried about it all the time. She almost called you class. She, all, she also worried all the time about death, about suicide, which was obviously on her mind. Doris Lessing picked up on that and wrote this story. 
in a way, this is Virginia Woolf. This woman just wants a room of her own. So she said, okay, I'm taking this bedroom, this is mine, and this is where I'm gonna sit, and I'm just gonna be me. Just give me a few hours to myself. Right, mom, what are, you, what are you doing in there, husband? When's the dinner? And they wouldn't leave her alone. So then she said, that's all she wanted. So then she goes to a hotel and she takes a room at a hotel. And she says, and the guy takes her money. He says, sure, you can have this hotel. She just wants to come there one day a week and just sit and just sit and think and be herself and see what happens and maybe write, okay? Well, what does the husband think? Where are you? What are you doing? Why are you going? So he follows her. He follows her. He thinks she's having an affair, of course. So he follows her and he finds her. What are you? Dun, 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 dun. She can't go anywhere for even five minutes just to herself. So she leaves again and she goes back to the hotel and the husband's going to, going to find her. But Doris Lessing lets us see what happened. She puts a towel over the door and she turns on the gas and she kills herself in that room. And that story is called To Room 19. It's grim and it's heartbreaking. And it is a feminist shout in the 70s because that's the way the feminist workers were feeling in the 1970s. The third wave of the feminist movement is absolutely stark and it's totally Virginia Woolfian. It was her bi biggest fear and Doris Lessing captured that in the story. Obviously Virginia Woolf argued for education as well. All three of these people, she's in that same timeline and then you see that last line, she is worried and rightly so that if women are not allowed to have that space to themselves, that time, and that ability to exercise their own genius, they will die. This is so important. It's straight from a room of one's own. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background here. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance even, and we know about this, a lot of women died, accused of being witches, were tortured and died, and even hanged. There's a book called A Woman Born by the poet Adrian Rich. She argues, I don't have stats on this, okay, so I'm going to get her to say this, that about nine million women were hanged and otherwise murdered as witches. And she argued that it was political because it was the women who knew how to use herbs, right? And that was a threat to the growing medical establishment. They were the healers. Okay. It was also the women who could help other women give birth to babies and they wouldn't infect them. Why? Give them childbed fever. Why? Because they were only midwives. So they weren't bringing infections from other cases to these women. When, however, one reads of a witch being ducked, of a woman possessed by devils, these healers were being accused of that, of a wise woman selling herbs, or even of a very remarkable man who had a mother, then I think we're on the track. Remember, we started with this talking about lost writers, of a lost novelist, a suppressed poet, of some mute in, and inglorious Jane Austen, I'll come back to that, some Emily Bronte dashed her brains out on the moor, moped and mowed about the highways, crazed with the torture that her gift had been, had put her to indeed I would venture to guess that anon and I grew up seeing and some of you may have a lot of uh, especially ballads poems and collections that said anon at the end anonymous who wrote those Virginia thinks that women did I think she's right that anonymous who wrote so many poems without signing them because they wouldn't have been published was often a woman let me move you back up here to where she's talking about some mute and glorious Jane Austen that is a reference to Thomas Gray's poem uh, elegy in a country churchyard where he walks among the poor and he sees all of these people who are buried there with their tombstones and their names and he wonders how many of them could have been Milton who wrote Paradise Lost the last British epic last English epic how many brilliant people because they are poor Okay, we're never able to realize their own abilities, their own geniuses, etc. But see the substitution? She says, here lies some mute 
inglorious Jane Austen. She, she loved Jane Austen. And she wonders about all of these women who are anonymous, who are lost throughout history. She will be too eventually. And then this is one of my favorites. She also speculates, what if instead of Will or in addition to Will, there was a woman? This is very famous and it's called simply Shakespeare's sister. Shakespeare did have sisters, but this is one that she creates. She names her Judith, Judith Shakespeare. And she says, Judith, like Will, or maybe in place of uh, Will, in place of Will, is brilliant, okay? Judith Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. How does that sound to you? Dolt. Judith Shakespeare wrote Othello. Doesn't fit? Exactly. She said it wouldn't fit. In the first place, she was never going to be allowed to publish those plays. In the first place, she was never going to be allowed to act in any plays. Women, you know that, did not act in plays. Men played the, the women parts. Her sonnets, her 154 sonnets, were never going to be published. And there's the theme of madness and suicide again. It's like a famous uh, athlete, for example, who has this kind of genius athletic ability, but you won't let him play basketball. You won't let him run track. Um, he, he can't run in the 36 Olympics and, 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 and drive Hitler crazy. You know who I'm talking about, Jesse Owen, okay? That we're not going to allow these people, these brilliant athletes, to perform. Virginia's attitude is, Virginia's belief is, it would drive them crazy because that is their bliss. That is their gift. But then she came up with something. In Professions for Women, 1931, two years later, she, remember the voices that I was talking about earlier? There was a poem written by Coventry Patmore called The Angel of the House. And Patmore thought he was praising women. And he said, oh, they're such angels. They, they do everything in these homes. They're absolutely wonderful. Morning, noon, and night, all they do, and they just sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Well, Virginia didn't have any of that. We've been examining that throughout this, this talk. She said that voice in the, her head, that voice in your head, in everybody's head, that says you can't do something is the angel of the house's voice. Because that woman sitting there in that house that Coventry Patmore is celebrating is actually a drone, a fake, okay? And she represents the idea that she can't do anything and it's that voice inside your head that says, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. You can't write. You can't paint. You're not allowed. Women can't publish. The angel in the house. So what did Virginia do? She killed that sucker. She told this group that she talked to that day that she had been invited to give this talk. And they wanted to know, what can we do as, as professionals? How can, what, what tips can you give us to succeed as professional women? And she said, kill her off, baby, every time. And that's for you and me, too. Every time that voice of doubt comes and says, you can't possibly do that. Every time people want to hold you back, Virginia says, kill them off. In other words, rub them right out again. And then she said, you know what your defense is? Self-defense. She said if she was called up in a court of law on a murder charge for killing the angel of the house, self-defense, I killed her. But she was lost for a while, and I've got to wrap this up, wasn't she? She was lost for a while. Some of you may know these names, some of you may not. Nobody did in the 70s until they were rediscovered by the feminist press in the 1970s. Kate Chopin's The Awakening was one of the most shocking things I had ever read. I had no idea, and it had been lost for a long time. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, some of you know the yellow wallpaper, but did you know that she wrote a dystopian novel called Herland? I didn't. It's amazing. And then Zora Neale Hurston, when I teach women writers, Zora Neale Hurston will be their favorite nearly every time. They love her. They were lost, but then they were found again by the feminist press. And I mean, direct you to these women. Run your eyes down them and look who's at the bottom. That's deliberate. 
I said, well, they, she's, not, she's not up there with, with, yes, she is. Of course she is. J.K. Rowling got kids reading again. I love J.K. Rowling. She's wonderful. And not just because all of her stuff's been filmed and the wonderful imagery. But let me tell you something. J.K. Rowling was a billionaire. But before that, she was on the public dole. She is a perfect Virginia Woolf character. She didn't have any money. Okay, and she was raising kids by herself. But her novels took off, didn't they? This is another, The Handmaid's Tale is another dystopian novel. And, that, and there's Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook. Her novels took off, didn't they? And she was a billionaire until recently. She slipped out of the billionaire ranks. And the reason that she slipped out of the billionaire ranks was she started supporting other women writers. And she started giving her money to charity and to women. She gave back until she fell out of the billionaire ranks because she was wonderful. Now we're closing. What's the women's suffrage movement doing here? She didn't march, but Virginia was a suffragette. She absolutely was. They loved her in the suffrage movement. And she published essays for the, sub <clears throat> the movement. She absolutely believed that the vote was a civil right for women. And they embraced her. <coughs> she used to go to the little their little offices and address envelopes for them. She was a working, a, a, a working stiff kind of uh, suffrage. That's the, that's the second stage of the women's movement. This is the 1970s. <coughs> now Virginia Woolf is one of the mothers of the women's movement. Okay, she has been rediscovered by the feminist press. You noticed, of course, that they were all wearing white in the suffrage movement. This is not a political statement, but there was a reason why Hillary was wearing white at the DNC and why she wore it again on Saturday. It is the color uh, that the suffragettes wore. And this is the next movement, and then this is the final movement so far. <coughs> and we're not gonna, I'm not gonna get political with you or talk about sizes of audiences or sizes of anything else. I'm simply, that was deliberate, I'm simply going to point out that the marches are continuing. And this is what was said from the dais, okay? At the end of um, the DC, I wasn't able to go. Cherith was able to go, <clears throat> but I watched it. And I wanted to share this last point with you. Virginia Woolf represents the full closure and moving forward of all of these women's thoughts and beliefs, as well as John Stuart Mill's, the movement forward across time for both women writers and the women's movement. And then, and I'm not gonna have time to read the piece that I wanted to, but because I've got to let you go. <clears throat> but basically, Virginia believed that if we all prepare for the woman writer, for the woman artist, if we all believe in her and, 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 and pave the way for her and anticipate her, then her voice will rise again. She won't have to die. And I argue that Virginia Woolf is that person and is that voice. And then this is the final. I, I don't have time to let you see all of that, but I'm gonna go here. You might not know who June Jordan was. She was a Caribbean poet who died too young, but had a fairly full life. And this was read from the Women's March, from the dais and the Women's March. And I know you've heard it before, but you might not have known who said it. We, Virginia Woolf, are the ones we have been waiting for. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it.